Hello everyone, good to see you again. In this video, I introduce custom lifetime value metric. Are you guys ready? Then let's get started. You've learned individual custom level profitability metrics, particularly size of wallet and share of wallet are the key metrics in that individual customers' profitability can be decomposed into those metrics and they offer a useful framework to develop marketing strategies. However, size and share of a wallet reflect transactions at a specific time or during a short time period, like a snapshot photo of a boy running continually. If a customer shops regularly and shows a clear pattern of shopping, the size and share of wallet are still useful to characterize profitability of the customer. Let me use the snapshot analogy. If the boy is running constantly in one direction, the snapshots of this boy are very similar to each other, very similar to each other, and one snapshot is enough to understand his movement. Like this, if a customer's shopping pattern is constant over time, just one observation of our shopping is enough to understand it. But it is not always guaranteed that consumers shop regularly. David, in the example for the size and share of wallet, spends only $1,000 per month for his grocery shopping, but we don't know what will happen in the future. It is possible that he increases or decreases his size of wallet in the future. Also, customers may switch brands in the future, meaning that the share of wallet can be changed. In addition, customers may become dormant and come back again. All of these cases are like a boy running in random directions. Of this boy, the snapshots totally differ from each other and one snapshot cannot describe all of his movement. That is, the size and share of wallet at one specific time are not always enough to measure profitability. Here's an example. Suppose that there are two customers and this figure shows their transaction history. Here, x-axis stands for time and y-axis stands for the dollar value of each transaction. And customer A made small size of the transaction at the beginning, and she left for a while, and then she came back with transactions of large amount. And customer B also shows a change in her transaction pattern. It seems to me that she just missed shopping a couple of times here and here. Unlike customer A, but she has reduced her transaction amount over time like this. So size and share of wallet at this moment do not reflect customer A's larger amount of recent transactions and customer B's smaller amount of recent transactions. That is, they are not enough to measure these customers' values over time. Then, how to measure the customer value or profitability that fluctuates over time? Now I'm going to introduce customer lifetime value metric which is very popular in practice to measure the fluctuating value. To understand this metric, the first thing you have to know is the present value concept, which is generally used to account for the value of time. Let me start with an example. Suppose that there are four friends, Alice, Emma, Isabella, and Olivia. Each of them is expected to spend $5,000 in total during the next five years. But the amount of spending in each year 
varies across these guys as follows. Alice is expected to spend $1,000 equally in each year. Emma is expected to spend all $5,000 in the first year, whereas Isabella is expected to spend all in the last year. Olivia is expected to increase her spending by $500 of the years. Question is, who is the most valuable customer for the five years? How do you think? Alice, Emma, Isabella, or Olivia, or Ty, because they all will spend the same amount of money for the years. Answering this question may not be simple. Then, how about this? This is much simpler. All right, here are two gift options and you can choose either of them. One is receiving $1,000 today and the other is receiving $1,000 next year. Out of these two options, which one do you prefer? I, I am 99% sure that all of you choose the first option, receiving the money today instead of the next year. Why? The amount of money is the same, but when you choose the second option, you have to wait a year. Then, Let's decrease the amount for the today option. How about $950? How about $900? How about $850? And what is the amount of money for the today option, which makes you feel both options equivalent to each other? Maybe, still not simple. So, one more assumption we need. Suppose that you are a really, really, really good investor and you expect 10% rate of return from your investment. That is, if you receive $900 today and invest it for a year, you will have $900 times 1.1 which equals $990 next year. In this case, you'd better to take $1,000 next year, right? But if, but if you receive $910 today and invest it for a year, you will have in the same manner, 1,000 plus 1,000 next year. It flips over your choice. You'd better to take $910 right away instead of take $1,000 next year. So we may find the equilibrium using the following formula. At the equilibrium, your investment of the money received today, which equals the amount of money received times 1.1 makes $1,000 next year. With a simple math, the amount is given by $1,000 divided by 1.1, which equals $909.09. Yeah, 909 and nine cents dollars. That is, with the 10% of rate of return, receiving $1,000 next year is equivalent to receiving 900 and nine and nine cents dollars today. And this value, 909 and nine cents dollar is called the present value, present value, and in short, PV of receiving $1,000 next year. The rate of return is usually called discount factor because it is the rate of discounting the value of future money. 
with a small discount factor, the value of the future money becomes higher. For example, the present value of receiving $1,000 next year becomes about $950 with a 5% discount factor. And it is about $990 with 1% discount factor. The present value denotes the point at which you at which you change your choice. If you receive less than the present value, then you'd better to receive $1,000 next year. But if you receive more than the present value, taking the money right away is the better option. Then, what will happen if you receive the money two years later instead of the next year for the second option? We can compute the equilibrium in the same manner. For example, when you receive $800 today and invest it for the next two years, you expect about $800 times 1.1 and times 1.1 again, which equals $968. This is less than $1,000, so you'd better to choose the second option. And we have the following formula at the equilibrium in the same manner. At the equilibrium, your investment of the money received today, which equals the amount of money received times 1.1 and times 1.1 again makes $1,000 next year. With a simple math, the equilibrium value is about 826.45 dollars. So if, if you receive less than this amount today, you'd better to receive $1,000 two years later. Just take the second option. But if you receive more than this amount today, you'd better to take the money right away. The present value concept allows us to compare the value of money between different time points. And we can apply this concept to the example at the beginning. We have four people here, Alice, Emma, Isabella, and Olivia, and the cash flows from those people for the next five years. And the strategy is as follows. You can compute the present value for each amount of money in each year and add up the present values. The sum is the net value of all money after discounting the value of the future money. Then, let's do this. First, compute the present value of each transaction. For simplicity, assume that discount factor is 10% per year. The table looks like so complicated, but when you carefully look at it, you can find that each cell is just a simple math. So for the first year, All transactions are discounted once, so they are divided by 1.1 once. For the second year, all transactions are discounted twice, so they are divided by 1.1 twice. Doing the same thing for the rest of the years, Dividing by 1.1, three times for the third year, four times for the fourth year, and five times for the fifth year, you have the present value of each transaction. Next, add up the present values. For Alice, the sum of the present values is about $3,790. This is called the, called the net present value, in short, NPV, 
of her transactions expected for the next five years. The NPV of Emma's transactions is about yeah, more than uh, $4,500. And for Emma, the NPV is relatively so low, about 3,100. And for Olivier, the NP NPV is about 3,400. So in sum, Emma is the most valuable followed by Alice and Olivier, and Isabella is the least valuable, even though all of them are expected to spend the same face value of money for the years. And why? Because of the, of the value of time, the later the money expected, the more the value discounted. Emma is expected to spend all of $5,000 sooner so she is the most valuable, but Isabella is expected to spend all of it later. So she is the least valuable. This strategy using the present value concept also can be applied to past transactions. Consider, con consider you received $1,000 last year. Then how much is that money worth today? Still, using the same discount factor, 10%, you will get 100 more from the investment. So the money you received is worth $1,100 now. If you received $1,000 two years ago, in the same manner, it is worth $1,000 and 210 dollars, which equals multiplying $1,000 by 1.1 twice. Then let's apply this strategy to Alice's past transactions as follows. She spent $800, $700, and $900 three years, two years, and one year ago, respectively. She also spent $1,000 this year. And Suppose that the same discount factor, 10% per year. First, compute the present value of each transaction. It is simply given by a multiplication by a rate. For the money spent three years ago, the present value of it is equivalent to the value of investing it for the three years, right? So this is the formula to compute The present value, which is 1,064 and 80 cents dollars. In the same manner, the PV or the present value of the money spent two years ago is about $850. And that for the last year is about, no, not about exactly $990. For this year, we don't need to compute because this $1,000, this face value itself is the present value. Second, add up the present values. Then the sum is about $3,900, which is the net present value of Alice's past, all past transactions. So far, I have introduced the present value concept. It enables us to evaluate an amount of money at any moment in current dollar value. This value is adjusted to account for the value of time. Thus, the value of the money expected in the future is discounted, whereas that of the money already realized in the past is inflated. Now, I'm introducing an application of the present value concept to measure the consumer value over time. It is very similar to what I have already explained. Basically, expected or realized margins from customers replaced for the face values of the transactions in the previous tables. 
PCV, LTV, and CE. What I am introducing here are these three terms. Past customer value, in short, PCV, lifetime value, in short, LTV, and customer equity, in short, CE. Sometimes, LTV is also referred to as CLV, which stands for customer lifetime value. Both terms are widely used and exchangeable to each other. In this lecture, I'm using LTV instead of CLV following our textbook. Conceptually, PCV and LTV are the net present value of past contributions and expected contributions respectively. First, let's start with PCV. The mathematical expression of the PCV of a customer is this. Uh-oh. So terrible and so complicated. It looks so complicated, so, so complicated. Yes, I agree. It is very, very complicated. But conceptually, it is the same as the net present value computation. Let me point out two components in this equation. This GC and delta. GC is gross contribution, which denotes the realized profit from a customer. And delta denotes the discount factor. Again, this equation is very complicated. I don't want you to memorize this equation. So you don't need to memorize this equation, okay? But my recommendation is to conceptually understand the steps of PCV computation. How? Like this. Here, PCV is basically a sum. This is a summation sign, right? Sum of gross contributions over time, but at each time the gross contribution is inflated by the discount factor, okay? So conceptually, yeah, yeah. Just understand the PCV in this manner. And for better your understanding, here is an example of PCV computation. Here's a five month history of past sales, sales yeah, from customer. And suppose that we are at the end of May. So we are here, okay? And the first step is to compute the gross, con gross contributions. Here, we don't have any information about cost. So we cannot compute the exact profit from the sales in each month. Instead, the 30% contribution margin is given. That is, profit are about 30% of the sales value. With this margin information, we can compute the gross contribution in each month. Okay, like this. <clears throat> and the second step is to compute the present value of each gross contribution. This is a monthly history, so we need a monthly discount factor. Here, the 1.25% per month is given as the monthly discount factor. With this discount factor, we can compute the present value of each gross contribution like this. So this is the, yeah, computed the gross contribution and we just need to inflate it by the one plus the discount factor four times for, for the sales uh, realized four months ago and three times the sales realized uh, three months ago and two for the sales realized two months ago and just once just for the sales just yeah last month and for the May yeah we are here so the the face value itself is the yeah, current value the present value 
10. The last step is to compute the NPV, which is just the sum of the present values. This NPV is the past customer value. This is the past customer value, PCV, which is what we want to get. So the computation of PCV is the exactly same as the previous example of computing NPV of net present value in all past transactions. Transactions, transaction values are replaced with just gross contributions and that's it. Now, let's move on to lifetime value. Again, mathematically, LTV is expressed in this complicated equation. You don't need to memorize all of this formula. It's just wasting of time. Rather, just try to conceptually understand the equation as follows. LTV is equal to a sum of gross contributions over time. But those contributions are expected in the future, so they are discounted by the discount factor before summation. And this is the basic model of LTV, basic model of lifetime value. In practice, managers usually take into account two more components, acquisition cost and retention or survival cost rate. To acquire a customer, there are always were cost. The acquisition cost is a one-time cost incurred at the point of acquisition, right? And differs from direct costs and marketing costs to serve the, cost, serve the customer and make sales. So the acquisition cost must be subtracted from net present value of contribution. This is the net present value of the, um, yeah. This part is the net present of the contrib contribution, okay? So the acquisition cost must be subtracted from the NPV to get the exact lifetime value. For example, even though there is a million dollar valued customer, she is not profitable when you spend more than million dollars to acquire her as your customer. Also, some customers will leave. More precisely, all customers will leave. The key is when they leave. Some of them leave sooner, but some of them stay for a long time. This implies the future contribution is probabilistic. Not for sure. We don't know. We don't know what will happen. So we already have a good metric for this probability, the survival rate. Survival rate denotes the probability of still staying as an active customer. So here, this SR is the survival rate. By multiplying the gross contribution by the survival rate, we can account for the probabilistic, na uh, probabilistic nature of the future contributions. For example, suppose that there is a customer who is expected to generate $1,000 of profit in the next year. But the $1,000 expectation is valid only if she will stay next year for sure. If she will leave next year for sure, it is reasonable to expect nothing rather than $1,000, right? But if she will stay next year at a 90% probability, our expectation should be discounted to account for the 10% risk of losing her next year. And this leads to $1,000 times 90%, which is equal to $900. And here is AC. Please note that the acquisition costs are subtracted after computing the NPV, again, the NPV of the gross contributions. The reason is that LTV is generally computed in dollar value at the moment of acquisition. Okay, so the 
as well, the moment of acquisition, the current value, uh, the current time is that moment. And LTV is basically computed in the dollar value at that time. So the face value of acquisition cost itself is the print value. So we don't need to discount or we don't need to inflate the acquisition cost. Unlike PCV, all of the components in calculation are expected values, right? So except the acquisition cost. So except the acquisition cost, all of the components are expected values here in LTB. So we don't exactly know the survival rate in the future, gross contributions in the future, and the discount factor in the future. So to determine those values, we have to rely on other information sources such as market reports, public statistics, and internal analysis report. But the information sources are not always available. And even though they are available, it is still very hard to correctly predict the fluctuations of the survival rate and the gross contributions. So in practice, it is usually assumed that the retention rate and the gross contribution is constant over time in LTV calculation. Then the survival rate becomes a power of retention rate with exponent t. And here t indicates the time that has passed since acquisition. And in addition, LTV is usually computed over the infinite time horizon meaning that the entire lifetime is considered. With the assumptions, the LTV formula becomes a simple form without any summation. So this is the yeah, final equation. And now, yeah, you don't see any summation in this equation, right? It is given by multiplying the predicted contribution in each time period, that is this GC, by a multiplier and subtracting acquisition cost. This multiplier is called margin multiplier, which is determined by the predicted retention rate and the discount factor. And this form is the popular definition of LTV in practice. You may find exactly the same formula in Blue Apron case study. This formula is simple, right? And relatively simple, yeah, than the original LTV equation, but provides us with a lot of intuitive marketing implications. Because LTV is a metric to measure profitability. So enhancing LTV implies improving profitability. Then when does LTV become high? First, the more the gross contribution, the higher the LTV. This is very, very straightforward because the gross contribution is the just amount of profit. So the more profit and the higher LTV, right? And second, the higher the retention rate, the higher the LTV. A high retention rate means there is a high chance to keep customers, right? So yeah, we can expect high lifetime value. Third, the lower the acquisition cost, the higher the LTV. This is also straightforward because reducing cost means improving profit, right? Fourth, the lower the discount factor and the higher the LTV. The discount factor is the rate of discounting monetary values in the future to account for the value of time. So if it is low, the rate of discounting is low and LTV becomes high. And please note that firms cannot control the discount factor. It is given by the market. 
economy, and other environmental factors. However, the first three components depend on, at least partially, your firm's marketing effort. All marketing, activ all marketing activities must be developed to clearly improve one of these components. Also, it must be clearly checked that whether the activity hurts one of the other components or not. Sometimes a marketing action to improve one component hurts another component. For example, you can offer discount coupons to your customers to enhance the retention rate, but it may reduce the gross contributions from the customers. LTV is a metric for an individual customer. Customer equity is a simple summary metric of the LTVs across customers. It is given by the sum of LTVs of all customers, which indicates how much the firm is worth based on the profits expected from its customers in the future. All right, in sum, Past customer value, in short PCV, is how much a customer has contributed to profit over time. In order to develop future marketing strategies, it is necessary to know how much customers will contribute to profit over time, that is, lifetime values of the customers. And PCV and LTV are conceptually on the basis of net present value, which reflects the value of time. In practice, activities and costs for acquisition and retention are additionally considered. All right, that's all I have in this lecture. And see you soon. Bye-bye.